Are we all dancing now? Yes. Follow Would you your... stand with me as we stand and lift up our hands? So this is how you do the guitar dance. screensaver in there from a different angle though okay at this time we'll let the children and their leaders go to the classroom I think I <laughs> and those who cannot. That fits the whacked out simple stuff, Josh. He needs help knowing how to turn it off. <laughs> Alrighty, so if you hadn't guessed it already by the piece of paper that you've been handed, we are going to look at two more locks. So this makes locks five and six for our locks on um, keys and locks on prayer. Two more makes five. Whoop, almost got it. Makes five and six. We're going to jump right in because I intend to tell a couple of stories. And I don't want it to go long, so we're going to jump right in. All right. So you're in the top half of the page. You're on the right half of the top half. Do you need help? Can you turn it off? You know how to turn it off? You got it? We don't want to hear it, so. You know how? You got it? It's okay. Sometimes you don't know how to do that stuff. I don't always know how to do it either, so. Okay. Ain't nothing going on on there that's important. This is what's important right now. Here we go. All right, so we're going to look at the top lock. Um, and I bet you, if we read this verse, you'll be able to fill in the where it says the three words that start with P, N, and P. And so the reference is there. It's James chapter 4, verse 2. And somebody might even be able to do that from memory. James 4, verse 2. But I'll just read it. 
He says, um, it's really B. The whole thing says, you lust and do not have, so you commit murder, and you are envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. And then here's the part that we need. Listen closely. It says, you do not have because you do not ask. Okay? And so we're t if we're talking about a lock of prayer, what do you think it might be? P and P. And we want to take a stab at it. Okay, so it's prayer. Got the first one. Prayer or prayers. We're definitely talking about prayers. This pen is out of ink. Nope. So let's read it again. You're trying. You're good. You're good. Trying is good. Trying is good. You do not have because you do not ask. So what kind of prayers would be the kind of prayers that would, would be locked? Our prayers would be away from God. Prayers. N and P. Two words. Okay, prayers not. We've got two words. Now we should be able to get it. Prayers not prayed. Okay? So I know this sounds overly simplistic, but I'll tell a story in a minute once we get through it to kind of give you an example, okay? So if you don't pray, God is not going to answer the prayer, right? Now you say, God, well, God might know my heart, and he might do what I need, even though I didn't pray it, and that would be true but it would not be in response to your prayer, okay? So prayers not prayed do not reach God. Remember, these locks are times when prayer does not reach God. And we saw four others, and now this is the fifth one, all right? And so sometimes prayers are not prayed because people are too busy, okay? Now I submit to you that that is one of the most common excuses that people make, and it's just, just an excuse. That's all it is. Because right? you can literally pray in your head or out loud while you're doing almost anything except possibly talking <laughs> or telling a complex story. And actually, you could be telling a story probably, and as long as you know the story, you could be praying in your head while you're telling it. Because I've done that. I've been sharing Christ, for example, and seen, like I've been praying in my head at the same time that I'm talking. So I know we can do that. So sometimes people don't do it because they're too busy. And sometimes they don't do it because we, the W is we, we want to take a guess. It's a fun little game. We think we know. Very good, RJ. We think we know. So this, is, this most often happens when you're looking for wisdom, discernment, guidance, to know what's going to happen next, or to affect what's going to happen next. So this is what happens. I don't want my loved one to die, but I think they're probably going to die. So I'm not going to pray for them not to die because... If I pray for them not to die and they still die, then I'll be not answering my, getting my prayers answered, right? Or for whatever other reason, we think we know what's about to happen, so we don't pray. And so if you don't pray because you think you know what's going to happen or you know what's coming next or you don't need wisdom because you think you already know the truth or whatever, then that prayer will not be answered, okay? I'm going to give you the next one because it doesn't tie in tightly with the text but it does tie in tightly with the illustration that I'm going to get to, and it is we may even think of it. Now I'm just going to ask you a point, point blank. If you think to pray and you do not pray, what would you call that? If you have a thought that you should probably pray and you don't, say, okay, good, that, you're getting really deep there, but you're right, that's quenching the spirit. So if you have the Holy Spirit prompting you in your heart or your mind that you should pray and you choose not to, you're definitely quenching the Spirit. Now let's say you're just learned along the way that you should pray, and it's not the Spirit per se exactly that's telling you to do it, but you just think, well, I should do this. This is something I know I should do. And you don't do it. Does anybody know what James says? If you know good to do and you don't do it, that is called sin, right? So if he knows the good that he should do and he doesn't do it, that's called sin. And so you may even think, well, you know, I should pray. You know, have that thought. And then not do it. And if you don't do it, that prayer that you would have prayed in response to the idea that you should pray will not reach God. Yes, ma'am. I have had that happen and was interrupted really quick and lost it. Just, and that's still wrong, huh? Yeah, still wrong. I should be running up to my room and just act this 
I wouldn't wait to go to your room. I think that I think yeah, I think the issue is we think well we got to go to the room and then somebody interrupts us and we can't go to the room so then we don't pray. I, the moment you're prompted to pray, I would start praying, and then if you know you're going to continue, then I would go in private. That's how I would do it. That's how I, uh, that's a good, great story about that with visitation. Back in the day when I started doing visitation with prospects, I wanted to have a flyer and business cards and stuff to give them when I got there, right? And I go to their house and invite them to church and stuff. And every time visitation would come around, I'd be getting the flyer and I'd be getting the cars and stuff. And one night I was doing that. And I was supposed to go at 6.30 for my visit. And I was trying to get the cards and, uh, and, and I found the cards. And I was trying to get the flyers. And I didn't have any more. So I was printing them off and I had trouble with the computer and everything. Got to be about 7.15 and the spirit was really on me heavily. He's like, you got to go. You got to go. You've got to go. And I'm like, but I need the, I'm telling God, right? Like he doesn't know. I'm like, God, but I need the brochures like, so I can give him something. And finally, I just threw everything down on the desk, and I ran out the door. And when I got there, as I arrived at the house, I said, hello. And she said, come on in. But she didn't say hello. She said, come on in. And I said, okay. And I walked in. And she said, we knew you were coming. And I said, well, how did you know that I was coming? And she said, because we needed you today. We've been fighting, and we're, like her and her husband were on the verge of divorce, and they're fighting over their teenage daughter who was in all kinds of trouble with the law. And it was, the house was in total turmoil. And we spent two hours counseling and praying and the whole deal. But I kept putting it off so much. And even had been times before I put it off, I never got around to it. Like I was making the flyers. By the time I got done making the flyers, it was too late to go make the visit, right? And that night, God just pushed me out the door. And I went. And when I got there, she was waiting for me. So it happens. And prayer, I think, is the same way. I, I think if, God, if it's in your head... I mean, obviously, it could be sin if God is telling you to do something else and you're going to go get alone and pray instead of doing the thing that God told you. That also would be bad, right? So, okay. So the, then the next one down, uh, this is just talking about prayer. We talked about this before. It goes back, right? So um, relationship requires communication. So right now, all the wives in the room are going, yep, yeah, mm-hmm, yep, yeah, mm-hmm. We need to talk. We we can't talk enough, right? And husbands that have struggled in a relationship realize that a lot of it was about communication. I did marriage Bible study with people before they get married, and there are three topics that kill a marriage faster than any other, and one of them is communication. Another is money, and the third is intimacy or sex. And if a man and a woman cannot settle those three issues in their marriage, it will plague their marriage for their entire time they're married. If it's 10 years, 50 years, all the way to death, it doesn't matter. It will always plague them. And I think all relationships require communication. And so I submit to you that if you are supposed to be praying and you're choosing not to, you are breaking contact with God. So be careful. So prayers that are not prayed do not reach the Lord sometimes because we're too busy. We think we know the outcome. That's our excuse. We already know what God wants or we already know where this is going. We, we may even think of it and think we should. Remember that relationships require communication. Okay? And so we're talking about prayers not prayed. And we have U and Q. What do you think that might be? So if you're praying to God, there's kind of two kinds of prayers, right? If I start praying to God, kind of one of them is maybe what I'm praying for, praying to glorify God, so outward. And the other is, which was actually talked about in the verse, asking. Do not have because you do not ask. So what are we talking about? Unasked questions. That's what we're talking about, right? And I submit to you, if you love God and want what God wants for you, even prayers where you pray, God, please do this, are questions. Because you know you really want what God wants, right? So if I say, God, please heal him, I know God wants to heal him, so it's no problem that I pray, God, please heal him. But I also know that sometimes God chooses to allow somebody not to be healed because that's actually what's better for them or better for their family or better for the world in general. So I always end with, Lord, your will, not my will be done, which is really a question because I'm saying, Lord, I really don't know your exact will in this circumstance, so please deliver it, and then I'll know, right? And then we end with um, unasked questions often go unanswered. Now, not always, right? Not always. 
Sometimes people will read you and they'll answer your question. Sometimes God will answer your question when you didn't even ask it. But I submit to you that it may be more likely that a lost person's asked question, which they have no guarantee of answered prayer, a lost person who prays to God does not have any guarantee in the scripture anywhere of any answered prayer except one, and that is the prayer for salvation, right? Whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved, so it says. And so, you right, brother? You got a soreness? You got one of these? All right. Uh, so, a lost person might have a better chance of getting an asked question answered than a saved person has of getting an unasked question answered. Why? Because relationships require communications, right? And if you're supposed to be praying and you're not, that could even be sin. And I think it's really hard for me to believe that God is going to answer prayers if you're walking in sin and actually despising him at the same time. So you're despising God not even talking to him about what's going on, and he's just going to do it for you anyway? Okay. So I'm going to tell you two quick stories about this specific example, and then you'll see how easy it is to fall in that trap. Okay? First one, had a couple in the church. They had a young daughter, and um, she got hurt. She busted her lip, had to get a stitch in her lip, and she busted her gums, and her one tooth was loose. She couldn't go to the ER. She's at the ER, and I heard about it, from somebody else that they told or whatever. And so I grab my hospital badge. I'm just going to go check in. I'm just going to see how it's going. I usually, by the way, if you go to the ER, if you let me know, I usually show up. Not always. It depends if there's another crisis, but I usually show up. Okay, so I get over there. And the first thing I do, oh, Pastor Dan, so so glad you're here. Will you pray for our little girl? She's really hurt. And would you pray for her? And I said, well, absolutely. Let's do it. And we bowed her head and we prayed for her. And then we sat there talking a little while afterwards, and, um, and I said, well, you know, a bunch of people, we heard about it, we spread, a bunch of people in the church were praying for her and everything. She said, oh, we're so glad. We just didn't know what to do. And the Spirit prompted me, and I said, well, did you pray? And they looked at each other kind of guilty, and they said, no. And the, one, the man said, we knew we should have done that. <laughs> and... What I'm getting at is in the midst of the circumstances, when things are crazy, right, it's out of control, or you're so concerned about what the outcome is, you're emotional in turmoil, whatever, it's super easy to get wrapped up in that and not do the number one thing that you should do, which is pray. To really always go, that should be your go-to. Somebody offends you, your go-to is forgiveness. And if you're struggling to forgive them, your go-to is prayer. Right? So they stack. So I'm dealing with an issue. You know, this guy hurt me. I want to forgive first. And then I might talk to him about the problem and help him understand what went wrong, whatever. But first I want to forgive because if you're coming to him out of an unforgiveness, you got another problem. Okay? First, go to when somebody offends you is forgiveness. Go to when anything at all happens that you were not expecting is prayer. First say to God, okay, God, I don't understand how I got here. Right? And, let, and help God Speak into your life. Open your ears. Right? Ask the question, how did we get here? I don't understand why this is happening. And it's okay. And you look at the psalmist prayers, there are tons of them that they're saying, look, I don't understand why this is like this. Does anybody have any question as to why it is in the world right now that it seems like the wicked are getting ahead? You know, it's been like that pretty much since the Garden of Eden, right? It always seemed like right before Noah, right before the flood, it really seemed like the wicked were getting ahead. Right? They're taking wives, not a wife, but wives. And they're they're building wealth and they're prospering and everything's going great. Bigger places, warring against each other, tons of sin, sleeping with temple prostitutes, just tons of sin everywhere, right? And it really seemed like the wicked were getting ahead. And then came the flood. And they certainly didn't get ahead that day. Right? So does anybody have a question? Why does it seem like in the world today the wicked are getting ahead? Well, the psalmist prays that multiple times. Why does it seem like the wicked are getting ahead? But the psalmist always comes back to the answer. It just seems like they're getting ahead, right? The story goes, the simpler, we don't understand this fully. The bigger you are, the harder you fall. There are people who are 
thriving or seem to be thriving. They're not because they're not alive, right? They're dead in sin, but they seem to be thriving in wickedness will resist to the nth degree putting their knee down before Jesus. But we will go before Jesus, put our knee down very readily. And on that day, they will be in their spirit. They will be crushed. They'll realize their foolishness. They'll realize how they've invested in all of these things and then be forced to bow nonetheless. And they will, they will despise it. They will want to die, but they won't be able to. And then they'll go to hell, and they'll really want to die, but they won't be able to. See? The wicked are not getting ahead. If anything, they're getting further and further trapped in the schemes of their own planning. Right? And they're su subjecting themselves to the things that they think are blessing them, but they're not. All right? Second story. Um, personal story. Okay? So, I was... This is back in the day, early on, first started preaching. And I, I was preaching at Northwood High School. And um, I was spending about between 20 and 25 hours a week writing my sermon, which I would then preach 45 minutes to an hour on Sunday. So I was spending almost, let's just call it 20, 20 times as much time preparing the sermon as I was preaching the sermon. And I went to a meeting out across town or whatever, and uh, one of the guys brought that up, and he says, does anybody have any issue with this? It doesn't seem like lack of efficiency, so we, we need to share the gospel with people. So why does it take 20 hours to write a sermon that takes one hour to preach? And I was like, I don't really have an answer for that. I said, first of all, I, I start with prayer. And I pray a lot. Like, so first of all, I'm spending about, sometimes as much, as much as 15 hours, figuring out what the text is for Sunday. So I'm praying. Like, God, we're, I'm all over the Bible. I'm studying the Bible. I'm praying. I'm like, oh, is it this? Oh, no. This I'll start writing a sermon. I'll get three points in. And I'm like, oh, but wait. This third point, kind of, that touches on another verse over here that has three points in it. And that's really where God was leading me the whole time and like that. And so then I'm like, I don't understand. And so I left that meeting. After that conversation, like I just described to you, and I went home and I was praying about it. And I'll bet you can guess, I'll bet you can guess, what God told me in prayer as to why it was taking me 20 to 25 hours to write my sermon that I would only take an hour to preach. And I didn't spend enough time praying. That was the problem. Right? So God said, yeah, I could give you this, this sermon in five hours or three, and it's hard to write a sermon in less than three hours. Yeah, it's almost impossible, right? Because you want to make sure you're cross-checking yourself. We're human. We can make mistakes. You're praying. You're asking God, what does this word mean? You're looking up words. You're looking, you're looking at other verses. I mean, it's, it's hard to do it in less than three hours. It's not impossible. I've done it in five minutes, but but it's hard. Yes, ma'am? Isn't there a scripture that says that we're not supposed to get um, um, worry about what tomorrow will bring forth? What will say? Yeah, because he will speak through our mouth. Um, Yes, but that's that sermon is that yeah, but that sermon is not really directed at preaching. It's directed at witnessing under dangerous circumstances, right? Because it talks about being hauled before governors, being persecuted. Like that's what it's really talking about. So yes, she's, she's saying you don't have to have a prepared message if you're hauled in front of somebody, or if you're if you're at the store and all of a sudden you're in a witnessing conversation. You can trust that the Lord will give you the words, right? And you, but I will say this. It's also assumed that you're studying your Bible and praying, right? Because where are you going to draw that treasure from, right? So anyway, so what I found out was I wasn't spending time in prayer and the Word every day. So then when I went to go write my sermon, God said, okay, well, we're going to spend about 15 hours praying and finding the text. See, so that's the 15 hours I should have been spending in the other part of the week. I should have been spending a couple hours a day or an hour and a half a day or whatever as the Lord leads praying and I wasn't doing that. So then I changed it around and I said, okay, well, Lord, so then I'm going to trust you and I'm going to be prayerful daily and then I'm going to study my Bible daily. And you know what the funniest thing that has happened? And it's been this way for over 10 years now, 15 years, because I, I, I literally have the next 20 sermons I might want to write. Like I'm so, I'm so excited about the text, you know what I mean? Like I'm, I'm praying and like I, I was doing it this morning and I was putting notes in my Bible app and I, I could have wrote three sermons in the half an hour that I was in my Bible app this morning. If you spend time in prayer and you study your Bible on a regular basis, 
you will usually have something to say. But if you talk to a Christian and they kind of don't have anything to say about Jesus, like when we go to inspirational mom moment once in a blue moon, it doesn't happen often, but once in a blue moon, or if we go to inspir inspirational moment and we only have the this song, this video, that kind of thing, and nobody's talking out of the Bible, nobody's talking out of their prayer experience. I'm not judging anybody, but it's probably because we're not really having a Bible and prayer experience. Because, like, I could do sometimes, like, I want to, Wednesday morning, I'm like, ah, I need the inspirational moment. I've got, like, ten things to say. And I don't want to, and I don't do that because we're supposed to be doing that, right? So I might come and I have one. <laughs> like, I, like, I'll, like, hone it down and just get one. But if you have something you prayed about and you studied, then you have something to say. And not just here, because maybe it isn't for here, maybe as much as it might be for the grocery store. It might be for your friends or for your family or whatever. So anyway, I, I wasn't trying to turn it into a positive. I, I'm saying to you, I had to repent. Because what I discovered was I was taking so much time to write my sermon, I wasn't spending hardly any time in prayer other than that. And that's, that can't be done. And it's the same thing with making your income or taking care of your family or whatever. You can spend so much time on something that you don't spend any time in prayer. And here's the lock. If you don't pray the prayer, it's not going to make it to God. Right? You have to think or talk it to the Lord at least in order for it to get there. Then that brings us to the key. I bet you can't guess what the one word key is. If prayer is not prayed, don't make it to God. The one word key for this lock is pray. It's pray. Right? So we always talk about praying. We always talk about we should pray more and things like that. But the bottom line is any prayers that you do not pray will not make it to God. So pray. Okay? Now the next four, the first blank that I've given you, ask. Four times ask. So the first ask, ask F. Well, that's true, but I, and, and I would do that frequently, but that wasn't the word I used there. If you do it regularly, and you do it when God wants you to do it, that would be called? Faithfully. 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 Say that again. What, what did you say? I said frequently. Frequently would be okay, yep. So, but I think it, I was saying faithfully, and I went with faithfully instead of frequently when I was thinking about it, because you could say, I'm just going to do it often, right? But often to you may not be as often as God wants, or it may be more often than God wants. So if you go faithfully, then you're governed by what the Lord is saying. That's why I put that there. So you can do it however you want, okay? And then ask in starts with an E. Okay, I like that. Ask in earnest, yeah, mean what you say. You could put that. That isn't what I had, but you could put that. I put emergency. Because remember this example in the emergency room where they did not pray for their own daughter that they were very concerned about. And I, and I hazard a guess, if you'll think back to your last three emergencies, whatever they were, the first thing that occurred to you might not have been to pray. But you probably did think about it, and I hope you did do it, but you may find that you didn't do it. And so... When you're in an emergency situation, pray. Whatever it is, he is your greatest help. In fact, we, we read that verse uh, on Sunday, that his eyes go through the earth looking whom he may assist. Okay, ask, see. I like both of those, actually. That, neither one is the one that I had, but I like them both. Okay, so let's say confidently. That means you ask because you know who you're asking, right? Let's say continually. Obviously, the Bible commands us to pray continually, right? Although I think we're talking about more intentional prayer where you're actually talking or where you're actually asking specific questions or looking for direction or whatever. When the Bible says pray continually, I think that's a lot talking about just like a state of being. We're always thinking to God, always listening to God. The word that I put was casually. It should be simple. RJ shared how when he first came to New Heights years ago, he heard Tommy pray out loud in front of the church, and it was like Tommy was praying to a good friend, and he usually does that to this day. He might, he might be intentional about picking certain words or calling him Lord or things like that, but generally, you talk to God like he's your friend. If you're just praying, remember what we talked about last word, or last time, two weeks ago, because I wasn't here last week, but um, if you're just praying the same words over and over again, that's like getting. That's like putting on a tux to take out your garbage. Your garbage is going to get to the curb either way. It's still going to be garbage. Doesn't matter if you're wearing a tux or not. Just talk to God. If you try to make it real formal, 
then you may miss out sometimes. And then the next one, however, though, is ask with an F. And I'll give it to you, formally. So do be formal about it. Why would we want to be formal about praying to God? Respect, right? You, you visit your girlfriend at her house for the first time ever. You look her dad in the eye and you offer him your hand. You may not have shaken someone's hand ever in your life, but you do it that day. This is God we're talking about. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He is the king of the kingdom. He deserves your respect. Also, if you're formal, then you know who you're praying to. I had a, there was a man in our church, and I was counseling him about prayer and whatever. And I said, well, because I had heard him pray and heard his spouse pray, and they never prayed in the name of Jesus. They never mentioned the name of Jesus. Now, they knew who they were praying to, and they wanted to pray, uh, but they never said, in Jesus' name I pray. And I, so I just asked. Why do you never say that? I mean, you don't have to say it every time, but why do you, ne do you never say that? And he said, well, I don't know. I guess I never really thought about it. Well, here's the thing. If you never really thought about it, you might wind up praying to somebody other than Jesus or in the name of somebody other than Jesus. So sometimes it's a good idea to mention the name of Jesus in your prayer so that you know they, he knows, Jesus knows, God knows, you know, everybody knows who we're talking to and who we're talking about, right? That it's, so sometimes do pray formally. But that means setting aside time. That means intentionally. You use certain words, that kind of thing. Okay? The next one starts with the D. As D-A. I'm going to take a stab at it. We're talking about the kinds, kinds of pray, prayer, how we should pray, how we should use the key of prayer. So prayer is one of our spiritual... Okay, that's neat. I like daily attendance. That is not what I had. It is a spiritual discipline. Okay, so this prayer, if you want, if the lock is prayer is not prayed, and the key is pray, so this is disciplined asking. Remember the verse? You have not because you ask not. So this is disciplined asking. And so by disciplined, it means I, I block out time. I do it in an intentional way. I plan it, right? Now, am I talking about repetition? Like, I'm praying for healing, so I do it a thousand times. <laughs> no, there are a lot of shaking heads. No, that's right. We're not talking about that, right? Because that's one of the locks. We had that one last time, two weeks ago. We don't just pray repetition, right? So sometimes you might need to take a moment to prepare your heart and make sure your heart is right. We'll talk about that in a second. And pray intentionally one time. Lord, I'm taking this very seriously right now. I'm coming to you, and I'm asking you, and I'm believing in faith, and this is what I'm asking you for. Give me courage to do the right thing, or give me wisdom, or solve this problem, or heal this person, or heal me, or whatever. And you ask one time. And if you want to end with the, your will, not my will be done, but Lord, this is what I'm asking for. And then when you're done, you're done. You know, repeat it a hundred times more. You know, although I will say, every time he lays the burden on your heart again, then I would repeat it, right? But you're listening to God to look for that prompt. Like he's saying, do you really care? Then yes, ask again, right? There's a, there's a text in the Bible that talks about that where um, the, he, she keeps bothering him. She keeps bothering the guy to give her justice. The judge keeps bothering him. She keeps bothering him. And then finally he gives her justice, right? But notice in that story, she's knocking at the right door She's talking to the guy who can give her justice, and no one else can, right? So she's intentional and formal about her request, and she kept coming back to him because he's the only one. And in that case, she was looking for justice. All right, last one. Ask, trusting, and then the Bible verse. All right, so, Natalie, what's the Bible verse? What is the Bible verse? That's correct. We began and ended with James 4, 2, 7. I think I need the honor today. All right, there's more coming. Okay, so we're going to the second lock. You're going to the right half of the page. We're going to James 4, 3. So the, if the first, if this lock was you have, be, or you do not have because you do not ask, James four three then says you ask and do not receive. So some people were asking and still not getting what they were praying for. That's not good. 
It says, because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. Okay? So this lock is, the I'll give you the first word. I left it off, but I'll give it to you. It's praying. Can anybody fill in the rest? What's the L? Starts with an L. Praying with a something heart. Lustful. That is correct. Very good. Praying with a lustful heart. So, Hannah, can you define the word lust for me? Put you on the spot. I didn't give you the definition in advance. You, you use the word, don't you? You know what it means? I bet you do, sometime or other. She's helping you. Okay, go ahead. Phone a friend. That's three times. Well, two times and a half. <laughs> okay. So lust is basically when you want something to fulfill your desires. And we mostly use it for the purpose of flesh. Right? So a man looks at a woman, and by, Jesus says, if you look at a woman and you lust after her, so you want her to fulfill your desires, it is the same as if he has committed adultery with her already. There is no difference in the sin. Okay? So can you lust after food? Absolutely. Can you lust after money? Absolutely. Can you lust after nice cars? Absolutely. Now, should you? Careful. Are we sure? Yeah, I think there's a line, isn't there? So you can want something to fulfill your desires as long as what? What's the limiter? Okay, that's easy. You took the easy road there. But you're absolutely right. That's an absolutely true answer. If that aligns with God. But let's say what? If what aligns with God? What do we need to align with God? Okay, your heart. Say it again. His will. Okay, good. Those are both good answers. So if the thing is going to fulfill your desires, what needs to align with God? The thing? The desires. The desires. That's the key. It's okay to want a sandwich. People got to eat. Right? It's okay to want a good sandwich. Right? Like I, when I was eating only vegetables and stuff, I discovered the, the burger, the Impossible Burger, which is only made from vegetable stuff. And I'm like, well... It's almost like a burger, and the one night I wanted an Impossible Burger because it's like a burger. It's not quite a burger. So that I, the one night I made an Impossible Burger myself on the stove out of beans and other parts, right? There was, so I knew everything that was in it with no chemicals, no nothing. I, I made, it was like a burger. It wasn't quite a burger, but it was pretty – it was like a burger enough considering I hadn't had any meat in like 12 days, right? So I'm like, yeah, pretty good. And then I went out – we went to camp, and while we were at camp, they made something – that was basically like that. From It was a sausage that was basically like that, but I think it had meat in it too. But anyway, the point is, you can want it for your own desires as long as, not the thing, but your desires are in line with God. That's the key. So what people are always trying to do is shut down the desires. I don't go have no desires. I don't want nothing. I don't want to eat. I'm not going to talk to anybody. I don't want a boyfriend. Not me. Nope, I'm never going to have it. I'm done. I'm not going to have kids. Nope, I'm done. I'm not going to do it. How many 15 to 25 year olds have you said? Have you heard say, "I'm never going to have kids"? Yeah, a bunch of them, right? They do it all the time, and then they have kids. And they go, "Well, uh, boy, was I stupid, right?" It's okay to want what you want. There's nothing wrong with that. You just need to bring your desires in line with God's will, so you do it in a godly way. And I submit to you, off text for one second, I submit to you. That when your desires come in line with God's will, they are more likely to be fulfilled. Okay? If they are fulfilled outside God's will, you just wind up with more desires. That's what happens. It's never fulfilling. Okay? So, this lock is praying with a lustful heart. And then there's two words there. They're WM and they were in the text. Wrong motives. Very good. Someone was listening. Thank you so much. Wrong motives, right? And a motive is just why you do something, and having a wrong motive is the wrong reason to do something. Simple, okay? 
And so now, these, all of these that are in the middle here are no something. So all those little blanks are no, and then there's no L. This was an easy one. No, no lust, right? So no lust. This one's harder. No G. But it makes sense, especially in our world. Nope, not grumbling. That's a, I, see, I see where you're going with that, but that's a different thing. Remember, we're talking about lusts or wrong motivations. These are all wrong motivations. Grumbling is a wrong motivation, but, the, the, but it, grumbling isn't really the motivation. It's the action that's precipitated by a wrong motivation. So what do you got? No what? What? No gain? Hmm, that's interesting. Greed. That's what I was going for. Yeah, so gain is almost the same thing as greed. Because you could gain a way that's not money. Mm, definitely shouldn't be boasting. Motivations for prayer. Think of motivations for prayer. Wrong motivations for prayer. Bitterness. No bitterness. Can't have, so you can't have bitterness in your prayer. Also, no starts with a P. Well, you know, you want patience in prayer. That's a good motivation. <laughs> Don't take like I can't have no patience in my prayer. <laughs> no, no, we want that one. We'll keep that one. Pride. That's good. Very good. No pride. No pride allowed. Okay. So no lust, no greed, no bitterness, no pride. Um, I mean, I see where you could. You don't want to pray in patience because you want to give it. You want the Lord to act. But I, I think we would keep patience actually. Okay. Um, so in these cases, or I gave you all of this. In any, there's the WM again, and we already know it. It's what wrong motives, right? In these cases, or in any wrong motives, we risk starts with an I. So we're down to. Risk what? One word starts with an I. Risk. It's a Bible word. If I give you one more clue, you'll get it for sure. The Israelites were guilty of it like crazy for a long time. Idolatry. Yeah, impatience would be true. You could risk that, but like it might not apply with, if you talk about praying in pride, for example. So if you, in any wrong motivations, we risk idolatry. And why do we risk idolatry? Because prayers to things prayed for. Okay? So in other words, I know this is going to sound weird, but if you just track with me for one second. Okay? So you, you, you get down with God and you're praying. And let's say you're praying for a car. Lord, I need a car. And then you're like, Lord, I need a 2010 car. And I really want it to be blue. And... Yeah. <laughs> yep. There you go. And so what happens is, what you're actually doing at that point is praying to the car. You understand what I'm saying? You're not praying to God at all. You're praying to the car because you're focused on the color of the car and the type of the car and I want the car and why do I need the car and all the reasons I have the car and you literally sit there and drum up everything you can think of about the car. And when you, when you really talk about something, you really think about how awesome it is, what's that called? It's called worship. Yeah, and it would be worthless speech as well, right? So it's worship of the car, not prayer to God at that point. That's one example is prayers to the things prayed for. It can be a job. Lord, I'm praying for a job. These are, God, I know you're kind of ignorant of my life and you really don't know what's going on. So let me tell you all the benefits that could take place if I have a job. And so you ask God for a job, and then you spend about a half an hour telling God how good jobs are and how, how much jobs are needed and all of that. Like, God doesn't know that. God doesn't know you need to work. He doesn't know you need an income, whatever. And you spend all the time worshiping the job, right, or the more money or the promotion or whatever. And so it, you can stray into idolatry if your wrong motivations are in your heart and it's greed and you start thinking about how good that job would be. Or you could be talking about a promotion. You could talk about how how you really deserve it. And so you spend your whole time talking about you. How smart you are and how capable you are and how well you should have it and how good you've been as a parent, how good you've been as a child, and you're worshiping you. Right? And so the danger of wrong motivations is that you can stray very easily into idolatry. Okay? Or just any God will do. 
That's the other thing. So you get praying about what you want and you have wrong motivations, and pretty soon you find you're not praying to God at all. Just if anybody will give you what you're asking for, it's all good. Right? So any demon, any evil spirit, any family member, the drug dealer cousin that you got, if he came along and gave you a free car, you'd be perfectly happy with that. It doesn't matter who gives it to me. It doesn't matter where it comes from as long as I get what I want. And it's very easy to do if you have wrong motivations when you, when, while you're praying. So idolatry is a very real risk. Okay? We're, we're close to done. Believe it or not, we're doing good. I don't know what time it is. Probably we're running late. Yep. We're, we're, I, don't know if we, I don't think we'll finish in three minutes, but we're doing good. Okay. So Psalm 37, 4. I'll read the verse and you, fill in, you tell me what the blanks say. I think I can do it. Psalm 37. Hopefully the translation is the same. Psalm 37, 4. Yep, pretty good. Okay. Psalm 37, 4 says this. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. And so if you take the word yourself out, it's delight in the Lord. So the key is delighting in the Lord. And I'll put it this way. You want what God wants more for you more than you should ever want what you want for you. Because God knows better than you do. You can be poor for five years and God's literally saving your life from a cocaine addiction or from violence or from, you know, that going down a road of pride and idolatry. I mean, or you can be sick and stuck in and out of the hospital month after month after month and and God is deepening your relationship with him, and then you get healthy, and you've got another 10, 50, 70 years, whatever, where you're walking with the Lord undefeated because you know he was with you during that time. And so you want what God wants for you. You don't want what you want for you. So if you delight in the Lord and in his will for your life, it will always, those prayers, delighting in the Lord, will always reach the Father. Okay? Dwell on and I'm going to give you a list, and they come, they, they come from Philippians 4, which I didn't put the reference down there, so that was a mistake on my part. If you want to jot it in there somewhere, you can, but it, there's no blanks for it. It's Philippians 4. Okay, so we're going to dwell on, and then I'm going to give you the list. 4, 8, I think it's 8 and 9. I'm checking right now. Yeah, it's... Uh, just eight. Okay? Finally, brethren, whatever is true. So there's the first one. Whatever is honorable. That's the next one. Whatever is right. Whatever is pure. Whatever is lovely. Whatever is of good repute. Did I leave enough blanks, or did I have one not enough blanks? Squeeze them in. Squeeze them in. We'll make room. Just like kids in the church van. Okay? Whatever is excellent, and then, so you should have the last one. It starts with a P. It's praiseworthy. I think I got them. I don't know if I got them all or not, but anyway, you get them all in there. Okay? It's true, honorable, pure, lovely. I think I skipped one blank is what happened. Honorable, pure, lovely, of good repute, excellent, praiseworthy. I made a mistake and skipped right. Okay. Anyway, so these are the things that you focus on. Why do we focus on them? To ensure that our heart is right when we pray to God. Right? I'm not judging, but when you watch a horror flick, turn the TV off and pray to God in the next five minutes, you watch. Pay close attention, because what's in your heart will not be right. It will not be pure. It will not be honorable. It will you'll you'll need to fix it, right? When you watch a movie with a bunch of lusty things in it, girls in bikinis running around, sex scenes, whatever, pray in the next thing. Yes. Then the, right after that, try to pray, or even during. I mean, you got an hour and forty-five minutes. You're not going to pray for a whole hour and forty-five minutes because you're watching a movie that's kind of. Eh questionable, that's going to affect your heart. And it's going to be hard to pray right 
godly. I can make it at that with my bow. I just horror flicks, gun fight, killings, and yeah. And I get stuck. I I know how to mm. feel. Get drawn like, into it. Yep. <laughs> yeah, it's not really a good. I've asked God to take I, me away from that. Game all game. things are permissible. Right? Yeah. So I'm not saying that's going to keep you from having anything like that, but if you're trying to protect your heart to make sure that this lock is open so when you pray, God can hear your prayers, then my suggestion to you would be avoid things that are not pure, not right, not honorable, right? All of those things, okay? And at least, at least, then we have this as a solution, all right? So Mark 7, 20 to 23, Jesus is talking. Uh, I'm going to read it real quick, and then this will be our last text. And he says, that which proceeds out of the man, that is, which, that is what defiles the man. For from within, out of the heart of man, proceed the evil thoughts, fornications, thefts, murders, adulteries, deeds of coveting and wickedness, as well as deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. You don't have to remember all those things, but what is he saying? All kinds of bad things come out of us, and when they come out of us, they come out of the heart. They attach to your heart, they come from your heart. All these evil things proceed from within and defile the man. And so it's the, what's on your paper is what flows out. That's the problem. So I want you to think about what you're producing. What you're producing can make your heart a kind of dirty thing. And if it does make your heart a kind of dirty thing, then when you go to pray to God, this lock can snap in place. And instead of your prayers going to God, they get stopped. Because your prayers are prayed in wrong motivations. You say, no, God can overcome that. Yes, he can. And the last blank is repentance. So you turn to God, and he can fix it all. He can take care of all of it. He can undo what you watched, what you saw, that you shouldn't have, the way you talked, the way you acted, that you didn't honor him, you didn't focus on the right things, because you committed idolatry praying for your car, or praying about your car, praying to your car, right? All of those kinds of things. He can fix all of that, but we have to turn to the Lord. And, and I, again, I submit, focused on the wrong things, it's hard to do that. It's hard to turn to the Lord because you want, you're letting your desires not be in line with what God wants, and then you want it, and you're going after it, and that's, not, that's interfering with your prayer life. We ask ourselves sometimes why when we pray, we don't get what we pray for. Well, James was very clear. You don't get what you pray for because you don't ask for it. Or maybe you ask for it, but you ask for it to spend it on your own desires, on the desires of your lustful heart, so that you'll have better, you'll want better, you want better, you want things to go better, whatever. And that's not, that's not the point. The point is to delight in the Lord and pray his will. And I think our and Alicia were already mentioning that earlier when we are talking about that's the key. Okay? All right. So... Unfortunately, we're out of time. I will give out more candy, but we're going to pray and be done because we got, um, we got I, and I also forgot to put the snacks and drinks in the cafeteria, so we'll go get that here in a second, and then we can fellowship over here. Anybody want to talk more about it, we can. Did anybody have a last comment or a question? I know we're over time, but. All right. So, we've got six locks and six keys. And you can go back over your worksheets and look at them again. And it should be, at this point, we should be deepening our prayer life so we can talk to God and know that he's listening. That's the goal. Father of heaven, I praise you and I thank you. You are the awesome God. Ain't no car, no money, no relationship, no beautiful scenery, no beautifully tasting thing or wonderful tasting thing. No provision of our God has ever begun to come close to you. You are our God. And just like they said at camp, I remember, and he said it very plainly, the greatest thing of all that you could give us is your presence, you in us, and you have offered it. And for those who believe and receive that you're, you're, you're right there doing it. You're doing grace every day, all day, and you're willing. You're willing to get down and muddle in our mess, waddle in our mud, overcome our difficulties and our problems, and so we just turn to you. And whosoever calleth on the, call upon the name of the Lord, to this day, still this day, we'll be saved. And we're calling upon you to cleanse us of what we've delved into, to help us focus our prayer life on only you. Lord, I, if I've prayed ever to a demon or an object or a thing <coughs> created, if ever I've done that, and I, because I'm a human, I probably have, Lord, I personally repent of that. And I pray that I will be aware of it as I pray that 
that you will be my focus, that your desires will become my desires, that I'll grow a little bit more every day or, or in leaps and bounds, whichever way you want it. And when I pray, I'll know that my God hears my prayers and that he's at work bringing about the events and the activities of the kingdom of God. When I think about wicked who seem to be prospering, I'll know that you are on the throne. I'll not, uh, I'll not despair because I know. And then I'll remember that our relationship, mine and yours relationship, uh, it should have communication in it. I should be talking to you and importantly listening to you. And I love it better sometimes when you talk than when I do. But I also realize I'm called to talk to you. And so, Lord, help me. Help us all to be the best followers of you we possibly can be, offering up our prayers when it's under our control to make a choice, Lord, keeping our hearts clean so that we can pray earnest prayers, faithful prayers, casual prayers because we know you're with us, formal prayers because we know you're the God of heaven and it's no small thing for us to be able to enter into your throne room and make our requests. And Father, we go forward with you, with you as our shepherd, with you as our guide, with you as our king, with you as our protector. And we'll lift our prayers up to you and to you alone. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much. This concludes our Bible study.